All right, View Church, good morning. How are we doing? It's good to be with you this morning. That was so fun to worship together. That was great. Needed it. Hey, so uh, like Victoria mentioned, it has been a really great day so far. I'm excited to bring the word. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Reed, my, past, my pastor. I mean, kind of. <laughs> My wife, uh, Victoria, and I get to be the lead pastors here, and uh, it's, it's super fun. Hey, football is back, baby. Let's go. Football season. I may or may not be in uh, three different fantasy leagues, so pray for my wife. That takes a lot of my mental bandwidth. Uh, anybody else with me? You got, you got three? Anybody? Got a couple? <laughs> My wife said, no, please. Um, thank you for being at church. I know that when Seahawks kick off at 10 a.m. on Sundays, it is a little hard. Uh, if that happens, you might need to start coming to the earlier service, okay, so that you can be here and watch your Seahawks. But excited for football season, excited for this series that we are in, too, Made for More. We are in week two of that, and so last week we opened and Pastor Victoria taught Give us a little bit of background about Ephesus, the city, about this book. So let me recap a little bit for us this morning. The Apostle Paul wrote the letter, the book of Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus while he was in prison. Ephesus was located in modern-day Turkey. It's on the west coast of the Aegean Sea. And Ephesus held the temple of Artemis, or Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of of the world. They also had a massive amphitheater with like 50,000 seats, they're estimating. It was an ancient port city, really important for trade. It was like a cultural hub. And so it was very strategic for the disciples to spread Jesus to this city in particular. Jesus himself spent some time there. And though there was resistance at the beginning, many people in Ephesus ended up believing and repenting and giving their lives to Jesus. We heard last week in chapter one that we are chosen by God, we are redeemed by Jesus, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to continue our series in Ephesians chapter two. If you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Alive and United in Christ. Before we read the chapter, here's an outline of what you can expect to see Verses 1 through 10, it talks all about salvation by grace through faith. So Paul unpacks that a little bit in verses 1 through 3. He's reminding us that without Christ, we're hopeless and helpless spiritually. And then we get into verses 4 through 10, and he just elaborates on the hope that we have in Christ. So you'll see a direct contrast there of, of what our life is like without Jesus, and now all of the amazing, beautiful things we have in Jesus. Verses 11 through 22, that's the second half of the chapter. At the beginning, it's a callback. He's saying, hey, remember who you were before Jesus. Maybe you're in the room this morning and you've been following Jesus for a long time. And so who you were before Jesus is way back in the past. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a, a brand new Christian and you're like, man, my past is like right there. It's who I was before Jesus is like right up on me. And maybe you've yet to put your hope in Jesus. You've yet to make him your savior. I hope by the, the power of the scripture, what we read today, that you'll see the, the beauty and how important it is and the amazing things that happen in your life when you put your hope in Jesus. Verses 12 through 15, Paul unpacks the unity of God's people, Jews and Gentiles alike. He talks more about peace that we now have with God because of Jesus. And then verses 19 through 22, it's the implications of this peace. So, hey, you ready to read some scripture? Yes. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, open up your Bibles, open up your YouVersion app. It's also going to be on the screen behind me. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll be reading out of the NIV. The beginning, it says, made alive in Christ. Verse 1, as for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work 
and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace, everybody say grace. Grace, grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Second half of the chapter, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Come on, anybody need some peace this morning? You'll find it in Jesus. He himself is our peace. Who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to you who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. Let's pray. God, I am so grateful for your word, so grateful for the truth that we read this morning. And so, Lord, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you move amongst us? God, I pray you would draw our hearts closer to you. God, I pray that as we quickly unpack the, the depth of this chapter, God, would it, would it resonate with us? Lord, I pray we would gain more understanding of who you are. We would learn more about your love and your grace for us, God. And I pray that each and every person here this morning, myself included, we would leave this place later filled up and ready to start a new week. We love you, God. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I don't know about you guys, but I love a good home renovation show. Anybody else? little HGTV action coming at you. Hey, one of our favorites is called Hometown. Anybody else? Okay, all right, a few, a few of you guys. And it follows this couple, Ben and Aaron, and they renovate homes in Laurel, Mississippi. Uh, Aaron is an artist, Ben is a carpenter, and together with their team, they restore these really cool old historic houses, preserving some of the history, but making them new. They're really cool people, they do good work, and the show is just 45 minutes, right? Sometimes you watch TV and you wanna be engaged. You're like, I wanna go in, I wanna like see something crazy. And then other times, you just need 45 minutes of just like nice people, right? And you just need to zone out. My least favorite part of the show is that in Laurel, Mississippi, you can still get a house for under $100,000. 
and then they do a $200,000 renovation and it's like a mansion, right? You're like comparing that to Washington prices. And so I bet a bunch of you are gonna look at homes on Zillow, right? In Laurel, Mississippi now. Um, maybe that's not your show, but you've probably heard of Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna, the king and queen of home renovation. Maybe you're a big Snohomish fan, so you love our local heroes, Unsellable Houses. Lindsay and Leslie, let's go. Maybe you're old school. I have this, like, it's got a reserved spot in my brain. Extreme Makeover Home Edition with Ty Pennington. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Move that bus. It's just like, it's burned into my memory. I cannot get it out, right? If you've never seen any of those, that is your homework. Go home, watch a home renovation show. It's very spiritual homework for you this morning. But we love these shows for the same reason, right? It's for the before and after. It's to see what this house was like before and then after. You're like, is this the same house? Right? All the hard work, all of the, the design, all of the, the effort that they put into it together. There's always the inevitable obstacle that come up. It's like, oh, there's termites. We're so surprised. It happens every episode, but like they overcome obstacles, right? Sometimes the side-by-side -side comparisons are crazy. Like, again, you just wouldn't believe that it's the same house. And so I love home renovation shows, but let me ask you this question. Have you ever seen that happen to a person? Have you ever witnessed someone go through a transformation that is so shocking that you wouldn't even believe that it's the same person? Maybe that's happened to you. Maybe that's part of your story. When you think about some of the stuff you've been through, the things that you have in your past, and the work that you are putting in to follow Jesus, maybe you seem and feel like a completely different person. Right? We can probably all think of people in our lives that were like that old unwanted house, broken, forgotten, and mistreated. But they've been restored. They... They've, they're following God through family, through friends, through hard work. They are a brand new person, almost unrecognizable. And again, maybe that's in your own story. You were broken, unwanted, forgotten. But praise God, through Jesus, you have been completely restored. Again, wherever you're at on your journey following Jesus, maybe you've been a Christian a really long time and it feels like that, is really far away. Maybe it seems really close, but Paul is getting each of us to consider those things, to not forget who we are and where we've come from. Twice during Ephesians chapter two, Paul encourages the church and is encouraging us today to remember their old life before Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter two, verse one. He comes out at the gate swinging, right? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And so this morning, I want you to know becoming a Christian is not about bad people becoming good. It's about dead people coming to life. Before we follow Jesus, we are spiritually dead, spiritually bankrupt. In John chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. He's a very important Pharisee of the time. He says this, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. We are not simply bad people becoming good. We are spiritually dead people born to life new in Jesus. J.C. Ryle was an Anglican bishop in England in the mid-1800s, and he said this, he said, to be born again is, as it were, to enter upon a new experience, to have a new mind, a new heart, new views, new principles, new tastes, new affections, new likings, new dislikings, new fears, new joys, new sorrows, new love to things once hated, and new hatred to things once loved. That one resonates. New thoughts of God and ourselves 
and the world and the life to come and salvation. So if you're a Christian here this morning, I think this concept makes sense. You're reading that list and you're thinking about things that you've been through. You're thinking about your own process with the Lord. Things that you used to like, you straight up do not like anymore. Your views, your principles, your joys. It's as if you have entered into a new existence. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Praise God for the things that he has brought us through. And it's not things that we like conjure up in ourselves, right? It's not that somehow all of our life transforms by the good work that somehow we can manage to do. It's the Holy Spirit at work in each and every one of us, sanctifying us. That's a big church word that maybe you've never heard before, but it's sanctification, and it's just the process of becoming holy. It's a process that the Holy Spirit does in each and every one of us, no matter how long you've been a Christian. On this side of heaven, it's a process that we are all on continually. But it gets started here. Our entire perspective is shifted. Who we are begins to be transformed from the inside out. And if you yield to that process, if you work with the Holy Spirit, transformation is actually fun. It's actually something you look forward to. And you actually start to say to yourself, man, I'm actually kind of learning what it means to be like Jesus. Who would have thought? What a beautiful thing. You begin to walk, talk, act, and think like him. Paul goes on to say in verse 3 that we used to gratify the desires of our flesh, and we were by nature deserving of wrath. He's saying that before knowing Christ, gratifying our flesh, doing the things that we wanted, whatever and whenever, that was our moral compass. That was our guiding principle. And if you've ever lived like that before for a period of time, you know that's a dead-end road. It is a never-ending pursuit of always trying to gratify those desires. It's just out of reach. And so if you can just like increase the volume of whatever you're doing, just a little bit more. Just a little bit here, a little bit there, but it's always out of reach. And so because of this, because of our selfishness, we were distant, we were far off from God, and we were deserving of his wrath. We know that God is merciful, we know that he is kind, but he is also holy and just. So that means that there's consequences for our actions. There are spiritual implications based on the choices that we make. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A life spent gratifying our flesh, chasing after our desires. It's a life distant from God and ends up in eternal punishment and separation from Him. So the first three verses in this chapter are pretty heavy, right? Like we're opening up and we're reading and we're like, wow, Paul, you're really going after it. But in verse four, everything shifts. Check it out. Ephesians chapter two, verses four and five. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. If you have an old school Bible with you, a book, highlight, star, underline, circle that first word, but. It's some of the stuff that we say is the big buts of Scripture. And they're really important. It's like a long list of all of these, of these negative things. And then there's a really big but that has really big implications. It's a big transitional key word say, saying, hey, all that stuff that I just said about how you used to live and what you deserved, all that is true, but God. Despite all of that news that Paul just just shared about us, God pours out his grace and love and mercy. And he adds, Paul adds, that we are saved by grace. It's nothing else. Pastor and author Jerry Bridges, he once, once said this. He said, some days we may be more acutely conscious of our sinfulness, and hence more aware of our need of his grace. But there is never a day when we can stand before him on our own two feet of performance, when we are worthy enough 
to deserve his blessing. Hey, we can't earn our way into heaven. The good things that you do are really good. Keep doing them. They will never be enough to earn a spot into heaven. It's all about God's grace. It's all about what Jesus did for us. It's not about trying to tip the scales into the positive. It's all about confessing to God, hey, I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. I need you. And it's about accepting that free grace into our lives and allowing the Holy Spirit to help us live like Jesus. We were dead and God made us alive through Jesus. It's only his grace. And so Paul continues on this thought in verses eight and nine. He says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Hey, sin is the great equalizer, levels the playing field. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. Nobody deserves it. But grace is a free gift to all of us. And so there's no boasting. There's no like, hey, I'm a better Christian than you. (laughs) What? Sounds like you need to pray, bro. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Without Jesus, there is no hope. We are stuck. We're stuck in patterns and cycles. We're trying to gratify our flesh and it doesn't ever lead us anywhere good that lasts. It's satisfying maybe for a moment, but it's a fleeting pursuit. But with Christ, because of his grace, because of his immense love for us that he pours out on us, we can now have hope again. We can now have right standing with God. Our hope, our meaning, our purpose and fulfillment and our our hope for life after death, it is all found in Jesus. Then we come to Ephesians 2.10. It's a very famous passage of scripture. Maybe you've heard it before. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hey, let me teach you a little bit of ancient Greek. It's the original language that this text was written in. That word handiwork, it's the original word is poema. Everyone say poema. poema. Nice job. You guys did good. It means this. It means that which has been made. It is a work of God, the creator. So Paul is reminding us that, hey, we have been made by God. We are a work of the creator. And he's reminding us that we were created on purpose and with a purpose. That purpose, he's saying, is to remain in Christ, to do the good things that he has for us. I love the idea that those good things are prepared in advance. It means God was thinking about you before you existed. That means that you are not here on this earth by accident. That means you have purpose and meaning and value. Even before you made the decision to follow Jesus, God saw you and he loved you. And he had a plan and a purpose for your life. And so he is inviting you into the good things that he has for you. So what are those things? I think they're going to look a little differently for each of us. For some of us, it's going to be to start a family, to raise kids, to teach them about Jesus. For others, it's going to be to start a business or to to step out into the marketplace and to somehow use that to glorify God. For others, it's to help our family and friends around us, even the really annoying ones, to find Jesus and to step into a relationship with him. And so for each and every one of you, it's maybe all those things, maybe a little bit different, but God has specific things for each of you. And they're all gonna share this common thread. It's about sharing his love with others. It's about, it's about being a light in a dark place. The center of your life is not yourself, it's Jesus. And your ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction in this life is not found in yourself. It's found in Jesus. And so the encouragement this morning is this. God has good things planned for you. So go do them. But just because they're good doesn't mean they're easy. Right? Talking to others about Jesus, it's almost never easy. Sometimes it's really awkward. 
Being a generous person, it's not always easy. The fruits of the Spirit, right? Church kids, get ready to sing the song in your head. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those things don't just come out of us naturally. It's the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And so these good things that God has for us, though they are good, requires some work. God has good things prepared in advance for you. And so this is all starting to click, right? We're, we're, we see that, man, we're without hope. We are hopeless. But then because of grace, when we have faith, man, we have right standing with God. We're like, okay, I get it. Verses 1 through 10, totally on track. And then Paul throws us a curveball. And the record kind of scratches and we're like, Paul, what are you talking about? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Thank you for that detail, Paul. <laughs> remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So, hey, if you're new to Jesus, if you're new to church, you're probably like, that's really out of pocket. What are we talking about here? And if you've been following Jesus for a while, maybe even still, you don't have a full understanding of what Paul is talking about here. But it's an, an incredibly important thing that Paul is unpacking for us. It's a call back to the Abrahamic covenant. If you're interested, you can read about it. Genesis chapters 12, 15, and 17 especially. Basically, it goes like this. God promises to bless Abraham. He says, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And that from Abraham's lineage, God is going to share his love and his power with the entire world. And the physical reminder of that promise, the physical reminder of that covenant between God and Abraham was circumcision. So every male that was a descendant of Abraham was circumcised. And up until Jesus, being an Israelite, following the Old Testament laws, that was the only way to have right standing with God. And so that means that the Jews that were around at that time, they were continuing to carry on the Abrahamic covenant. They were observing the act of circumcision. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled the Old Testament. He fulfilled the laws and he established a new covenant. That means it's a new agreement between God and people. It's a promise that he cannot break. It's a promise that he will never take back. It is a promise between God and and his people. And this new covenant that Jesus established, it's not founded on obeying a bunch of laws in the Old Testament. It's founded on grace. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, each and every one of us can have a right standing relationship with God. And so that covenant, again, it was no longer only between God and a certain group of people. It's not just between God and the Israelites. It's open to anyone and everyone who might believe. So Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. He's writing to people who are not ethnically Jewish. And so there's this big argument between the Jews and Gentiles of like, hey, if you want to come into relationship with God, this is what you got to do. And Paul is now saying, hey, I, I get it. These people were calling you uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, and he's saying, hey, we are now one people. Yes. We used to be separate. You used to not be included in the promise. You used to be two different groups of people. But because of Jesus, now we are all together as one family. So here's what Paul is getting at. Here's what Paul is getting at. He's already opened with this. He's saying, remember who you were. I've already mentioned it a little bit, but if you've been following Jesus for a long time, maybe who you were before Jesus is a long way in the past. And now maybe that's a good thing, but what Paul is saying here is don't ever forget who you were. Don't let the gift of grace lose its importance in your life. 
just because it's familiar. Don't let it lose its impact. I think it's, uh, I think it's easy sometimes when, when we're like, we're like in, we're just doing the Christian thing. <laughs> and we're doing it really good, right? We're reading the Bible, we're, we're praying, we're coming to church. It's really easy to forget how much we need Jesus. And so today, would this, would this be, if you're in that place, there's no shame, but would today be a reminder and a renewal of receiving that grace from God? We eventually get to verses 13 through, through 18. And so Paul expands on this idea a little bit more. He expands on, on this idea of two separate people. Now we are all together as one. Jesus came and he preached to both Jews and Gentiles alike. And additionally, he poured out his spirit on Jews and Gentiles. So if you're wondering what that means, if you are not ethnically Jewish, you are a Gentile. And this is good news for all of us here this morning, that Jesus came for everyone, that his Holy Spirit is poured out upon everyone, that no matter what you have going on in your past, no matter where you're from, you have access to the Father through Jesus. Jesus came for you. And so now we're all citizens of the same household. We are all one family. We are all one people united in Christ. Verse 20 says that Jesus is our cornerstone. That mean he, means he's the foundation. He's the thing that holds it all together. The thing that holds it all up and unites us all as one. Without him, without his grace, access to the Father and peace with one another would not be possible. It is only by Him and His grace and what He did on the cross. I want to end our time thinking about verse 22. It says this, And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So I want to ask you this question. It's not a rhetorical one. It's one that I want you to contemplate in your mind, in your heart. What does it mean for us to be a collective dwelling place for God? So Paul is writing this letter to a church, to a group of people. He's saying, you have this spirit in you. And not only does God reside in you, but together, collectively the spirit moves amongst you and is a dwelling place in you collectively that's why it's important to come to church because we need other people we need one another we need to worship together we need to share our stories we need to talk about what's going on in our life we need to encourage one another and as we do that as the holy spirit moves Amongst each and every one of us, we are walking out being a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So unpack that in your heart, in your mind. What do you think that looks like for us here at View Church? What does it mean about how we act? What does it mean about how we talk? About how we spend our time? About how we support and encourage one another? If you're able to this morning, would you stand to your feet?